can we please talk about books in The White Lotus? Mostly because I am still recovering from the finale of season two and I need something to distract myself. I'm in a state of mourning. And one thing that I love about this show is that everything feels so intentional. From the paintings in the background to the way that some scenes replicate old Italian movies like this one, you can see a side by side right here of Aubrey Plaza and Monica Vitti genius to the locations. Honestly, I feel like countries should bid to host the next season of The White Lotus like the Olympic Games. And also the outfits. I think everything is so carefully considered. Even Portia's outfits. The real police may be coming after Greg, but the fashion police are coming after her. But what I wanted to focus on today is specifically the books featured in the show. Because books in The White Lotus actually have a lot more symbolic meaning than you may have initially realized. And I've been studying them, mostly as an excuse just to like binge the show, but also so that I could present my findings to you guys. So I'm gonna talk about both season one and season two, but let's kick off with season one. There's a moment in this series when Shane Patton asks the girls Olivia and Paula if they're actually reading the books that they carry and they respond saying no they're just props and they tell him they have a fashion stylist for their clothes and a book stylist to tell them which books to carry and all I want to know is where do I apply for that job? That is my dream role. Of course, this is all part of the social satire of season one. I definitely think that season one focused on a kind of class commentary. Season one is all about social class, whereas I think season two focuses more on masculinity and sex. And then money is kind of this overarching theme in both. So the specific books that we see characters reading. Shane Patton is seen reading Blink by Malcolm Gladwell. This is a kind of pop psychology book about how to make snap decisions. This is what Gladwell calls thinking without thinking. And Shane is definitely a man who doesn't think that hard about things. He's very impulsive. And Blink argues that great decision makers aren't people who spend a long time deliberating. It's more about making snap judgments. And I feel like Shane is exactly that stereotypical bro who only reads nonfiction and takes it way too literally. He's obnoxious, he's kind of a mansplainer, and he does seem to make decisions without fully considering their impact and effect on other people. The writer and director of The White Lotus, Mike White, had this to say. It seems like he's stoking his curiosity, but it hasn't gone very deep. Gladwell is the kind of writer that makes you feel smart while you're reading it, whether you are or aren't. But what I think is really interesting is the fact that his wife, Rachel, is reading My Brilliant Friend by Elena Ferrante. And here's what the director had to say about that. I love Elena Ferrante's books, but they are a little trendy. Rachel is not someone who's going to be reading some obscure book. It made me feel like she's a smart reader, but she's also trendy and maybe a little behind the trend. My Brilliant Friend is a fictional book about the intensity and power of female friendship, but it's also a book about class jumping and also the origins of social class. Now, this is something that Rachel is astutely aware of as someone who has recently entered a world that she isn't really used to. She has married someone in a different social class to her and this man is telling her to quit her job and live a life of comfort. So these books tell us a little bit about these two characters and their thought process, but it also establishes a dichotomy between them. The books they read symbolically show us the difference between Rachel and Shane. It's fiction versus non-fiction. It's creativity versus fact. It's deep contemplation versus quick snap thinking. It's emotional intelligence versus just textbook intelligence. And I think that helps us to understand not only the characters, but also their dynamic and the relationship between them, and especially where that may clash. Interestingly, Blink also includes this case study about a man who says that he can predict whether a marriage will be successful or fail within minutes of meeting a couple. And of course, whether this marriage will be successful or fail is the driving storyline for these two characters. Also, this might be my inner literature student coming out, basically trying to explain why the curtain was blue, even though the curtain was literally just blue. But the title Blink made me think of the term Blink and you miss it. Like they're on this beautiful vacation and honeymoon, but the whole time Shane is so preoccupied with complaining about trivial things that he kind of blinks and misses it. Should have warmed up because that one was a stretch, but <laughs> let's move on. As I mentioned previously, the other two characters that we see reading in this season are Olivia and Paula. Now they are seen reading a wide range of literature, each of which examines social and political systems. So we have authors 
authors like Nietzsche, Freud, Paglia, Franz Fanon, Judith Butler, and more. These books cover subjects such as colonialism, race, gender politics, performativity, and all of these things are of course themes in the show. Also, note that Paula specifically is the one seen always reading books about colonialism, and that is her key conflict within the show after she sees local Hawaiian people dancing for the predominantly white tourists. Because of the reading that she has done, she is aware that this is problematic, but when she tries to help, it kind of goes wrong. In fact, it goes very, very wrong. That was like the understatement of the century. And I think that the point here is that we see that these girls have a wide ranging awareness of social and political issues. And they're also capable of a significant amount of empathy, unlike other generations. These girls have a genuine interest in educating themselves and bettering both themselves and society, but they only have a surface value level of understanding of these things. Mike White told the Wall Street Journal, they're the type of young women that I have met that has a mastery of all the latest lingo and is able to reduce everything to a cultural stereotype in a funny and cutting way and then you add an intellectual approach as well. Some might say they're meant to represent the woke liberal left, but I always find it hard to take woke as an insult if it just means like <laughs> capable of basic empathy. And really in season one, Olivia and Paula are actually the only characters to even identify the kind of systemic social issues with their vacation in Hawaii. When they joke that their books are just props, they sort of acknowledge the assumption of superficiality. It reminds me of those articles that came out about how Bella and Gigi Hadid were carrying books around as accessories when really they were probably just reading them. I made a whole video on this if you want to go and check it out. But yeah, I think that Olivia and Paula are meant to be these characters who are trying to educate themselves but are not quite there yet. And that leads me on to talking about the generational differences that are established through the reading in The White Lotus. I think that the series makes a comment about the speed at which these characters read the books. The girls are consuming books at a completely rapid pace to the point of absurdity. They are each reading something different almost every time we see them, at least in every episode. And I think this is testing testament to the high information diet that young people are currently exposed to. I think we're being encouraged to question how much they can actually be absorbing if they're consuming books at such a rapid pace, and whether that knowledge is being thoughtfully considered, or whether key buzzwords are just being memorized and then regurgitated, and I think it's the latter. And that's probably why they're able to call out things like colonialism and sexism and internalized homophobia when they see it, but when they're challenged, usually by people of an older generation who are much more assertive and self-confident in their beliefs, they struggle to retort. Like Mike White said, they're kind of armed with the vocabulary and the lingo to identify problematic behavior, but the next step of their criticism is to add that layer of depth. So they're on their way, they're trying. On the contrary, we have the patterns. They're a very slightly older generation. I think this is kind of meant to be the difference between millennials and Gen Z. We see them each reading just one book throughout the entire series. And actually at the end of their week long holiday in the final episode, we see that Shane is still actually only a few pages through Blink. Next, and I think this is one of the most clever uses of books in the show. I wanted to talk about how the act of reading and proxemics is used to show us the changing relationships and dynamics between the characters. We'll start with the girls. They are almost always mirroring each other down to the way they hold the books and their body language. We see how they are totally in sync. They come as a unit until of course they're not. And this exaggerates the fact that attention eventually arises in that relationship. Because when tension arises in episode five, we see an end to this together and harmony. When they're fighting, this is the only time we ever see them not reading at the same time. Olivia is reading and Paula isn't. You can also see that they're physically separated. They're not mirroring each other anymore. And once that tension is resolved by episode six, they revert back to reflecting one another. In the airport scene at the end of season one, we're shown visually that peace has been restored and they're back to holding books in exactly the same position. It's so clever because it's almost like subliminal messages subtly telling us that they're back to the way that they were. That equilibrium has been restored. Then we have Shane and Rachel who are never seen reading books at the same time. And this by contrast shows a lack of symmetry in their relationship. Rachel is seen reading a book when Shane is on the phone to his mother, when he speaks to the German couple, when he goes and talks to the girls, and when he's ranting and raving about the room. In all of those scenes, Rachel is trying to read her book. Meanwhile, Shane is only ever seen reading whilst Rachel is having this like existential crisis about their marriage. We never see them read at the same time. We never see them relax at the same time. 
this is showing us their lack of compatibility. They're totally out of sync and we are being constantly reminded of that through little bits of symbolism like the books. And this continues into season two. But before I talk about season two, I wanted to let you know that this video is very kindly brought to you by Squarespace. If you are looking to create a website or an online store so you can build your brand and get to stay at the White Lotus for season three, Squarespace should be your first stop because this is an all-in-one platform that makes creating a website so easy. They have a range of really useful templates which you can use as a perfect starting point, which you can then customize and edit and make something that's entirely your own and reflects yourself or your brand. There's great analytical tools so you can see what your audience are enjoying and what you should therefore make more of. And I love the blogging feature so you can give people a bit more of a behind the scenes look at what you're working on and help people get to know you and your brand on a more deep and personal level. If this all sounds good, you can head to squarespace.com for a free trial and then check out squarespace.com slash Jack Edwards and use the code Jack Edwards to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. What a bargain, you lucky sausage. Anyway, thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and now, Season two. Firstly, let's talk about Ethan. Ethan is seen reading Everything is Fucked by Mark Manson. And to take that title very literally, that is kind of his storyline. However, the subtitle of this book is a book about hope. And I really think that perfectly describes his and Harper's relationship. You know, everything is fucked. They have to reach rock bottom in order to find hope and restore the spark in their relationship. And ultimately we end the season with a sense of hope for their relationship. As well as that very literal interpretation, the fact that he's reading a self-help non-fiction book that's all about self-development and growth, I think gives us an insight into his character and his priorities. He's recently built up and sold a company that has created a luxurious life for himself. And also we see him going out running every morning. You know, he wants to focus on himself. He is definitely a character who cares about self-development. And I think the book choice adds to that overall characterization of who Ethan fundamentally is. Meanwhile, we have Harper played by Aubrey Plaza and just phenomenal. She is seen carrying this book called Lost Children Archive. Now this is a novel about a family whose road trip across America collides with an immigration crisis. And what I think is interesting about this is when specifically we see her holding it. She goes down to breakfast, she wants to read her book, but she's interrupted by Daphne and Cameron who call her over. They then go on to have a conversation about voting where Daphne and Cameron confess that they don't vote. And here in the first episode of the show, we establish the difference between Harper and Daphne and Cameron. She wants to think critically and read a book about social consciousness, whereas Daphne and Cameron are the epitome of ignorance. And at this point, she cannot relate to them at all. Honestly, Daphne just wants to drink her Aperol spritz in peace. She embodies the ethos of no thoughts, just vibes. Meanwhile, Harper is someone who votes and cares about the state of the planet and society. She does not want her and Ethan to become ignorant now they have money. And I think that's why she continues to read books like this. While Daphne and Cameron initially represent everything she does not want to be. You should also know that Lost Children Archive is also a book about a struggling marriage and the lengths a couple will go to in order to preserve their marriage. And ultimately, that's kind of what this storyline becomes. So again, all of this is very intentional. We then see Albie reading a book called The Architecture of Closed Worlds. And this is a book which is basically about how self-sustaining systems operate. So things like submarines, space capsules, office buildings. And if you think about it, the White Lotus is essentially a self-sustaining system. It's a hotel where everything you need is in one place. I mean, they literally eat at the same restaurant every night. Just imagine all of the amazing local food. They're not eating, it infuriates me. And I think Albie's closed world is one of privilege. He is the son of a successful director and someone with enormous amounts of money. He has enough disposable income to just give someone $50,000. His father considers this a karmic payment. He can literally buy himself out of his problems. And I think that Albie's plotline is kind of about him sort of becoming aware of this privilege and then just completely missing the point. And maybe that's why we always see his reading being interrupted. Like he never quite reaches the conclusion that he should maybe be reaching. Seriously, he and Portia have like three brain cells between them. They deserve each other. They actually need each other to combine. Instead of trying to expand his closed world, he tries to bring Lucia into it. He says she should come to LA. She should be with him. His method of problem solving is to make someone leave Sicily and come into his closed world. Eventually, his inability to see beyond his closed world is what allows Lucia to scam him. And you know what? 
as she should. Name a more iconic duo than Lucia and Mia. I will wait. And in season two, reading is used once again to establish the changing dynamics between characters. When Harper is reading in bed, Ethan is working on his laptop. She is trying to relax in vacation mode, and he is focusing on work. Again, they're out of sync. Unlike Shane and Rachel in season one though, at some point we do see Harper and Ethan reading at the same time. And I feel like we have a lot more faith in their relationship. So it makes sense that occasionally we do see how they're compatible. We do see that they can work together. Whereas with Shane, I was like, Rachel, run. Run for the hills, get out of there. In season two, I was kind of rooting for Harper and Ethan. And what I also wanted to talk about in season two specifically is the characters who don't read. Tanya, for example, the icon, the legend, the moment. Tanya tells Portia that she's bought the most recent edition of Vanity Fair magazine. And later in the season, we also see Daphne carrying Vanity Fair. Come on, the fact that it's the same magazine referenced both times means it has to be intentional. And I don't think it's an accident that the magazine they chose has the word vanity in it. Tanya and Daphne are two of the show's most superficial characters. We love them, but they are superficial. And I think that the difference here between a magazine and a book is used to show how some characters like Harper use their leisure time to think and reflect and criticize, whereas Daphne and Tanya just want to relax. Head empty, no thoughts. They want to look at luxury fashion and accessories. That is their world. And don't get me wrong, I'm not saying that anyone who reads a magazine is superficial. That's not my point. But this placement, specifically in the White Lotus is meant to show Tanya and Daphne's frivolity. Now, another character who we would not expect to see reading is Cameron. And we never see him reading until a very crucial moment. When Harper and Cameron go back to the rooms and Ethan suspects that they might be having an affair, Cameron emerges from his room and says that he went back to get his book. Now, up to this point, we have never seen this man read. In fact, I don't know if any of us thought he was capable of reading. It's so out of character, it's off brand to the fact that this is his alibi increases our suspicion that he is not telling the truth. This is a moment where the writers want us to suspect that Harper and Cameron are not telling the full truth. And so the fact that Cameron says he went back to get a book makes his story even less reliable and untrustworthy. We don't believe him. So there you go. Those are all of the references that I could find to books in The White Lotus season one and season two. I'm obsessed with this show. I am genuinely worried that the theme tune might be in my Spotify raps 2023. It's a bit of a problem, but it's such a bop. If they played the White Lotus theme tune in the club, I would be having the time of my life. I wish each episode was like five hours long. And I also sincerely hope that this video has restored your faith in British boys called Jack, because this guy, he was giving us a bad name. If you're new around here, you should hit that subscribe button harder than Tanya, hit the boat. And you can also give this video a thumbs up if you enjoyed it. Oh, and this is super cool. I now have channel memberships where you can join the community of book lovers by pressing the join button down below. There's loads of really cool perks. You get exclusive content each month, extra videos from me, and you can influence my upcoming videos. So the link to that is down below. But for now, thank you so, so much for watching this video. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring it. Stay safe out there, guys. Don't stay at a White Lotus hotel because you probably won't make it out alive. <laughs> All the best, stay in touch, have a wonderful day, and I'll catch you next time. Bye-bye!